welcome everybody to this talk sponsored by the Institute of World Politics. For those of you who are new here, welcome. An IWP is a graduate school of national security, intelligence, and international affairs. We offer a doctoral program, seven master's degree programs, including two that are online, and 18 certificates of graduate study. If you are interested in learning more about us, please feel free to uh, visit us at iwp.edu. And if you're interested in supporting the work of IWP, please visit iwp.edu backslash donate. Before we begin the lecture, we ask that you take a moment to silence all devices that you may have. So I'll give you guys just a minute here. Thank you. Uh, today we'll be hearing about, uh, from Mr. John Pelson, who will deliver a lecture entitled China's Threat in the Realm of 5G and Cyber. Mr. Jonathan Pelson, a telecom industry veteran and author of Wireless Wars, a China, China's Dangerous Domination of 5G and How We're Fighting Back, tells the story of how the U.S. lost the wireless market to China and describes a path to retake the lead. The former chief of convergence strategy for British Telecom and leader of organizations at other global telecom companies, he uses this extraordinary, extraordinary access excuse me, to tell the stories of the executives who faced Huawei and China's other telecom equipment companies, describing the grave consequences to freedom and security if we don't respond to the threat of China's global ambitions. Please help me welcome John Pelson. Thank you, Sean. About two years ago, I set out to write a book. It was going to be about how the United States lost the telecom equipment lead to China. And uh, I planned on drawing on my 25-year career in telecom to tell the story. And this was going to be a business book that I was writing. IWP does not have a business school. So you ask yourself, why did Dr. Lanchowski asked me to come and talk to the group. Early on, when I was working on the manuscript, a friend of mine found himself sitting in a conference room somewhere up in Columbia, Maryland. I don't know who he was meeting with, but he was giving a, a presentation on cybersecurity. One of the people in the room with him, uh, as we were waiting to go into their meeting, introduced himself, and he was the former section chief in counterintel at the FBI, and he ran the Huawei team. My friend told him about my book in progress, and put, put the man in touch with me, John Lankhart, at the FBI, former FBI. And uh, I said to him, why would the FBI have a, a Huawei team? And he said, well, where has Huawei deployed its gear in the United States? And this is the cell, cell tower gear, the antennas, the radios, it's things that, that you put into a cellular tower to connect to your mobile phone so that you can get access to the network. Uh, I said Huawei has not really been able to sell into the United States. They were blocked by AT&T, Sprint, T-Mobile. All these guys wouldn't buy them just out of concern for security issues. They're, they sell to mom and pop companies in the, in the middle of nowhere that have 10 or 20 cell towers. And he said, well, do you know what's located out there? And I said, well, it's Montana, it's North Dakota, there's nothing located out there. And he said, well, yes and no. That's where we put our nuclear missile sites. That's where we have our Special Operations Command. That's where we put the nuclear sub-base and other really, really confidential, secret military and national security assets that we want to have far away from prying eyes of rivals and enemies. He told me that Huawei had deployed its gear around nearly all of these locations around the United States. And part of his job was meeting with these companies that were deploying it, saying, do you really want to do this? And their answer was, FCC approved it, FBI doesn't outlaw it, they're offering it for $10,000, not $100,000 from Nokia, who incidentally doesn't even return our phone calls because they don't want to send a technician out to Great Falls, Montana to repair a bad tower. What, as I then began interviewing other CEOs and scientists and now interviewing intel officers and law enforcement personnel, a different story started to unfold. And to my amazement, information that had never been reported in the media started to come out. What had started out as a business discussion ended up really a tale of international intrigue. This was about high tech spying, hacking, compromising of senior government officials, including senior American government officials. And I ended up telling the story of what I describe as the largest front company in history, which is the $130 billion Huawei telecommunications equipment company. 
Don't get me wrong, Huawei is an extremely competent company. They have world-class engineers and scientists. They have probably the best end-to-end -end selection of telecommunications equipment, especially wireless and especially 5G, of any company in the world. As one AT&T executive told me after touring the Huawei factory, this is a very hard-working company. Every desk has a sleeping bag at it. He wasn't saying that to, to be funny. He just noted that they all had bed rolls and pillows at, at every desk. No company, however, no matter how well run, can get where Huawei got as fast as they got there. They say it takes nine months for a woman to have a baby, but nine women can't have a baby in one month. And that's true unless you send them out to steal someone else's baby. And what was happening is Huawei was, with the support of the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, going well beyond any typical support of a national champion, we're working with state intel support to uh, enable the country's objectives. Ironically, this is consistent with Western ideas of capitalism, where the mission of a company is to deliver for its owners, for its shareholders. Technically, the employees of Huawei own Huawei. Uh, they don't get votes, though. The votes are executed by the union, the employee union. The union does not answer to the employees. The union answers to the more senior union. The more senior union answers to the national union. And well, you know who the national union answers to in China. Effectively, the CCP is the owner of Huawei. And Huawei serves to execute for their needs and requirements. What I realized early on was that Huawei's goal was not to become the most successful telecom equipment company in the world. Their goal was to expand China's influence in the world and help them become the most powerful and influential government in the world. To compromise China's rivals' ability to control their own destiny and to extend the CCP's philosophy of surveillance and suppression of dissent around the world. They were getting pretty close to closing the trap, too, when suddenly COVID struck. And the rest of the world finally began evaluating China's transparency, its reliability, its trustworthiness on delivering on promises as part of the supply chain. Between the COVID backlash and a surprisingly consistent and aggressive response from successive American presidential administrations, China was stunned to find that its national champion had suddenly been hamstrung. The timing was awful for China and great for the rest of the world. If we hadn't suddenly developed a spine to stand up, I think Huawei would not only be deployed around much of the world as it is today, but I think they'd be deploying in the United States and across Europe. In the case of 5G, this would have meant a lot more than just the ability to listen in on phone calls and internet sessions. And I told you this was not a business talk. It's also not a telecom or technology talk. But I think it's important enough that I explain what 5G really is so you understand why this is not about spying on phone calls. Uh, 5G is the fifth generation mobile technology. 1G, introduced really in about the 80s, was first generation analog mobile phones, the big brick or the car phone suitcase in the trunk of your car. It allowed you to connect to a phone network from a wireless device as if you were on the network. 2G was digital, so it was a little more secure and you had texting. 3G came along. You could send emails. You could sort of get on the internet, but not very well. 4G, introduced about 10 years ago, was a true internet experience. Now you could do two-way video conferencing. You could get always on internet communications, true broadband, 10, 15 megabits per second. 5G is not the faster version of 4G. It's not the next step. 5G ma makes a break from the successive generations of communications. The key value proposition to 5G is enabling what's called the Internet of Things. So if 5G is done properly, what you do on your mobile phone will be the least exciting thing about it. So I'll give you an example of the capabilities that will enable this. 4G, if, if it allows 1,000 devices to connect to a cell tower, 5G instead of 1,000 might allow 50,000. Now why is that important? If you're a farm and you want to equip all of your factors, uh, tractors with multiple devices, tire pressure, angle of the, the plow, uh, oil pressure. If you want to have sensors in the soil telling you about moisture levels or nutrients, you may have five or 10,000 devices spread over a farm. 5G enables this and allows it to happen quickly and securely. If you're a pharmaceutical factory, your 
manufacturing processes are already today moving to 5G connectivity. So temperatures, volumes, mixes, quality control, everything that used to have wired sensors is going wireless, and the wireless is going from things like Wi-Fi to 5G because it's faster and it's more secure. So what this means is someone who has control over a 5G network, someone who's supplied the hardware, even if they're not operating it, now has the ability to throttle a pharmaceutical factory during a crisis with an, with an outbreak. They have the ability to take a port that's bringing vital materials in and slow it down or shut it down, disable a port remotely at the stroke of a, of a key on your keyboard on the other side of the world. So controlling the equipment, supplying the equipment that enables 5G becomes a matter of national security, far more than spying or eavesdropping on people's conversations. I'll give you a couple quick examples of where this has already happened just prior to the rollout of 5G and where you see the security at least matters. Casinos are highly secure facilities in terms of their information technology. There's huge amounts of money are moving, including electronically through the casinos, and the high rollers tend to be people who want to maintain their privacy and have very high net worth. There was a, a technician at a casino that had aquariums throughout the, the trading floor, and his job was to keep the, the tanks clean monitor the oxygen levels, the salinity, feed the fish. This is not a high security job. And so he dropped Wi-Fi sensors into each of the tanks, left the default passwords on them, and used them from his desktop so he wouldn't have to waste his time walking around looking at the machines, looking at the tanks. The bad guys got in through these Wi-Fi devices and were able to download the entire high roller database from the hotel and compromise their entire IT system. The stories go on. You hear them all the time about cybersecurity hacks. Look at HVAC systems, air conditioning and heating. There was an example recently about a system being put in at a research university, a big state university, does a lot of government uh, uh, work. And before they even turned on a new HVAC system, the remote sensors there to measure temperature and operations had been hacked, and people had downloaded proprietary research information from the university through an air conditioner. This is the danger of 5G, and this is why this is not about technology, this is not about business, this is about political uh, survival. Huawei is the world's largest supplier of the communication systems that I'm describing to you. And they're down right now, but they're not out. So today I want to talk about three things. First, how the US and the world got into this mess, relying on China to supply 5G gear. Second, why this is not a business competition, but rather a geopolitical conflict. And third, I'd like to share my perspective on how we might get out of this mess, improve our national security, and maybe even build a path to regaining a role in supplying the world's communications gear in wireless and elsewhere. So the review of history is not really for your entertainment, although I think it's pretty entertaining. It's, it's, what I want to take you through on that is because what's happened already in telecom is continuing to happen elsewhere in the world. And Elon Musk may be the smartest richest man in the world, but he just opened factories in China because they have good cheap labor and it's access to a great market and they have brilliant scientists ready to work for him for pennies on the dollar. So he better pay attention to what happened to Bell Laboratories and the world's greatest research institutions really over just the last 20 or 30 years. U.S. invented cellular in the 60s and 70s, mainly came out of Bell Laboratories. Motorola was key, Nortel, uh, and you may not know some of these companies because even Bell Laboratories, the world's greatest innovating company, the one that invented sonar, the transistor, radar, solar panels, communication satellites, they're gone. My kids tell me nobody even knows the name anymore. You have, you have to cite the marvelous Mrs. Maisel or whatever it is. Her, her father takes a job from Columbia at uh, Bell Labs and he's very excited about it. Today there are no native manufacturers in the US that make telecom, wireless telecom gear. All the gear we put into our networks, all of it comes from Finland, Sweden, Korea, Japan, and above all in the world, China. And nearly all of it, even the stuff coming from Finland and Sweden is being made or assembled in China. <clears throat> the, the reason, just to very quickly go through how that transfer happened, all the American companies moved their manufacturing to China in the 90s. It looks like a boneheaded move, and there were plenty of boneheads making decisions at that time in the, in the industry. I worked in the industry myself. Uh, the reason they had to do it is because if an American company like Lucent 
didn't move its manufacturing and R&D into China. They said, we're going, to stick, we're going to stick with Shreveport, Louisiana, Oklahoma City, where their facilities were. But if Ericsson or Alcatel or Siemens moved its facilities to China, those trusted suppliers to America, because they were, would have been able to sell their equipment into the United States at 10 cents, 20 cents on the dollar. And Lucent would have been put out of business right away anyway. They had to move to China. China required IP sharing in the joint ventures that all the Western companies set up. You ask, what is IP sharing? It's not a thing. It's never been a thing. No one's ever said, we'll do a joint venture. You have to turn over all your intellectual property to us, and then we'll work together. But don't worry, we won't use it against you. It took very little time before the companies that sprung up in China, who should have become customers, partners, suppliers to the incumbents, very quickly became the dominant suppliers in the world. Uh, the, the Western companies and the companies from Japan and Korea found themselves facing superior products using stolen technology augmented with excellent engineering and unlimited bottomless government support to make it even more effective and sell it at non-economic levels. That's an important thing. This is not about dumping. For decades, it was sold at prices that didn't make any sense. Why did China take a seat at the table? Why did we invite them? Bob Zelik gave a talk in 2005 when he was Deputy Secretary of State about China's entry into the World Trade Organization. In it, he explained that China was not the Soviet Union of the 40s, and we could work with them. He gave four reasons. He said, number one, China does not see itself locked in a death struggle with capitalism. And I think that was prescient. China really did embrace capitalist models. Number two, he said, China does not believe its future depends on overturning the world order. I think that was also true. They wanted to work within the system. Number three, he said, China does not see itself in a conflict with democracy around the world. And there you start to see a problem. Unlike Russia, he said, they're not against free speech, democracy, and self-expression. And number four, he said, China, unlike the Soviet Union, is not spreading radical anti-American ideology and propaganda. And it was way off on that. If they weren't doing it overtly at the time, they certainly are now, and really at the time, the, the machine was already in, in motion. As Mr. Zelik continued, he described China's leaders as being primarily focused on developing their economy and modernizing their society. He saw a country that was trying to do what Japan, Germany, and Korea had done after they were devastated by wars. We know that China was not, in, a fact, in fact, like those countries. Their primary goal wasn't really just to raise the standard of living in the country. Unlike the Soviet Union, China had the insight, they had the wisdom to adopt capitalism as their, as their operating model, but their plan was not to just better achieve national wealth. Their plan was to achieve wealth that would allow them to gain control over both their own population and manage a billion plus people, as well as extend control over the rest of the world. The desire for power in the world is not some evil thing. All rising powers seek to increase their own influence in the world. The problem lies in the core principles of those ultimately controlling <coughs> those authorities. And if you're cynical about Congress, take a look at the Politburo or the Central Committee, and you can really see where the danger comes as China becomes more influential in the affairs of other countries around the world. The problem was that Huawei's growth was not about business. It was about helping China and the CCP achieve this hegemony. This was not loss leading to grow market share. It was a government-backed initiative to take out all competitors and get Chinese managed gear deployed into all of the rival nation's networks. And this is where I had my second revelation, to my second point. The ongoing battle to deliver the world's 5G systems is not a commercial business battle. It's not a market struggle in any normal sense. You see that in the scale and the nature of what would otherwise look like just corporate espionage. I'll give you an example here. China offered uh, some time ago to build the African Union headquarters. It was a wonderful gift to put up a quarter billion dollar facility in Addis Ababa that would be the, the center of that continent's business, politics, and military activity. They donated $250 million including all the video conferencing systems, all the in-building electronics, the security cameras, and the entire data center, all filled with Huawei servers. Ribbon was cut in 2012. It was not until 2017 that the full extent of China's donations really became clear. 
Uh, it was discovered that at midnight, servers were firing up and uploading all the military, political, and business information to servers in Shenzhen. Huawei did not point a finger at the CIA or the NSA. They didn't blame their own intelligence services and say, look what they've done to us. We had no idea. In fact, what they did is they closed ranks with the government officials in China and said, it didn't happen. These are not compromised servers. They're perfectly good. Everything's fine. There's nothing to see here. <clears throat> what company chooses to participate in something like that, knowing the potential damage to their commercial business when it becomes known what they've done? This could never happen in a developed country, right? Well, I, I talk in, in Wireless Wars, I talk about the hack a few years prior to that of Nortel, which was in some ways the leading technology firm for wireless. Their building was so thoroughly compromised that the computers and servers from laptops of field engineers up to the CEO's desk phone were all being monitored by servers in China. When Nortel went bankrupt and had to shut down, in great part as a result of this, the only entity big enough to take over this massive campus was the uh, Ministry, uh, National Defense, uh, Department of National Defense for Canada. <clears throat> they started to move in and they realized that the walls themselves were filled with microphones and cameras that had been placed through all of the facilities. And they had to shut things and take months to strip down the walls and remove these listening devices. For me, a pattern emerged as I learned about some of these stories that, again, most of which were never reported in the American media, and many of them never reported anywhere in the media. The pattern emerged, it was not consistent with a for-profit firm. This global tech colossus was really just an agent of China. Now, our government gives aid to our national champions. Take a company like Cisco. They make the internet servers and gear to power the internet. Uh, Wall Street Journal did a study. The US government funneled about $40 million to help Cisco succeed over a 15-year period. US and local government officials. $40 million, it's a lot of money. Over the same period, Huawei got $75 billion from the government. Now, that's enough money to let a massive company run a $5 billion loss for decades, undercut all your competitors, and still grow, hire staff, hire R&D people. <clears throat> they, they knew economically it's impossible to make that 75 billion back, no matter how many years you stay in business, no matter what your margins are. It was a decision knowingly to lose money. They didn't make money, they never will make a profit, but they did destroy Bell Labs and all their competitors in, uh, in most of the world. Here's where you see the difference between business and war. In business, in free market capitalism, if you engage in trade and you come out better off than you used to be, it's a good deal. If the other side is better or worse, you don't care. But in free market exchanges, both sides can be happy with the deal. Both sides can get richer. Both sides can win. It's the, the beauty of capitalism. In war, in transactions for war, the metric is relative, not absolute. So you don't have to be better off when you're done with the transaction. You just have to be better off compared to the other guy. And if you just think about it, that's really what all military exchanges are like. You take all these valuable resources, instead of making a tractor, instead of making food, you're making a bomb. That bomb will never be productive, but you're hoping that all the money you wasted on that bomb will destroy even more value for the enemy. And if you can build a $1,000 bomb that destroys a million dollars of your enemy, you win, even though you both just got poorer. And this seems much more like the the nature of the exchanges that Huawei was engaging in with Western communications company. Their business transactions are far more consistent with geopolitical struggles than with, with business transactions. <clears throat> now, am I going overboard using the rhetoric of war to talk about Huawei? It's a, it's a technology company. You tell me, here's what the founder and chairman of Huawei, Run Zhengfei, called out to his assembled managers when the clamp started to tighten on Huawei and they started to realize that they were in trouble. He, he told his leaders, and I'm quoting, surge forward, killing as you go to blaze us a trail of blood. I've never heard a pep talk from a manager that sounded anything like that. You know where this company is coming from. It becomes clear we have to reevaluate what appears to be business conflicts and look at them more in the appropriate context of geopolitical rivalry. Uh, the problem is not that we're dependent 
on another country for, uh, for vital supplies. It's nothing new. We get all our avocados today from Mexico. It doesn't matter. And it's not that these were really important things that we're counting on from China, because we already count on critical things to come from Sweden, Finland, or all our telecom already comes from foreign countries. The problem was, and, and I should point out, that type of interdependence is actually peaceful. It leads to peaceful interactions. If you get all your insulin from another country, you're a lot less likely to bomb that country. So deeply intertwined interdependence is, interdependence is not a problem. It's a mitigator of problems. The problem is when it's not Finland or Korea or Japan that's supplying this. The problem is when the trading partner doesn't share your liberal worldview that we're all in this together and if we come out ahead, we don't really care whether you also come out ahead. So much of what we've confronted as bare knuckle business or even corporate espionage is actually more state actions from a country that sees us not as a trading partner or even a competitor, but as a rival for global power. So on to the third part. What can we do about it? There's no simple fix here. Even in the area of 5G, which is something I know a little bit about, there's no obvious compelling solution to achieving independence from reliance on, a, on an untrustworthy vendor. I can suggest what I think the answer will need to look like, and I can flag some tempting approaches that I think we should avoid. So there's some broad rules in looking for an answer. So general guideline number one is don't play China's game. If our approach consists of our federal government picking a single initiative, saying we're going to put all of our wood behind one arrow, we're going to, set in, we're going to take this one company, we're going to back it, we're going to make this the key to our response to China, uh, we are doomed to fail. China is a lot better at that than we are. Our leadership have repeatedly said we need a whole of government, whole of society response to the threat from China. Now that part is absolutely true, but it doesn't mean and we, we will need to spend a lot of money at the national level, we'll have to make sacrifices, and we'll need across the board commitment and engagement. Building chip plants in the US is one way to do that. And the government is writing $20 billion checks for every new chip fabrication plant to onshore that. That's necessary. <clears throat> but we're not going to win by trying to create a government-backed colossus to face Huawei or by setting a national policy where everyone in America is supposed to join in and do their part to support the federal initiative. That's not how America works. It's not how America should work. We do need whole of government. We have to address the government's role, though, in a way that's more consistent with American values and with values of free countries around the world. <clears throat> Guideline two, we need to just enforce the rules. I heard stories along the way when uh, Lucent Bell Labs had something called the Pathstar system and three uh, fairly low-level engineer Chinese spies stole the software. They were employees of Lucent, but they stole it and they were bringing it back to China. CEO of Lucent was told, if you pr on a visit to China, she was told by the Ministry of Telecom officials, we don't know who those people are, we have nothing to do with them, they don't work for us. If you prosecute them, we will not buy anything from you for another year. It's a funny response to have for someone who happens to be a countryman and, and is stealing from your, uh, your vendors. Lucent was on the verge of bankruptcy. This would have been a billion dollar loss to the company. They said, take a, a fine from these guys, let them go, forget this. They had to or the company could have gone out of business. They were never really prosecuted. We have to enforce it, not just fines, there have to be bans and there have to be much stricter protection of IP and uh, consequences for espionage. If, if you look at the uh, International Telecommunications Union, this is, uh, this is an example of how we have to uh, be a lot stricter in how the rules are being set to favor China too. And I'll just point out, right now the, the International Telecommunications Union, which <coughs> makes the standards that wireless networks operate on, is run by a former executive at the Ministry of State Communications in China. He's finished his second term now, and he'll be succeeded either by a member of the Russian Ministry of Communications who was former VP of Huawei, or an American uh, technologist who's been at the ITU for some time. Those are the types of areas where we have to make sure 
we flex our muscle and use our authority to try and have people in roles that are not looking to, uh, to seize power for one country as opposed to figuring out what's good for the industry. Guideline number three is the most important. How do we win? We play to our strengths. <clears throat> we have some great strengths over China. Free countries in general, and the United States in particular, have cultures that tolerate behavior that's more chaotic, disruptive, challenging of convention. There's something called permissionless innovation. I did not coin the phrase, but uh, I, I certainly talk about it in the book. It is, I would call that America's superpower. This means delivering breakthrough solutions that were not asked for by the government, were not funded. In fact, they weren't even allowed. They break social norms, they break uh, convention, sometimes they break the law. And examples of this are Uber, Airbnb, Facebook, Twitter, Amazon. You, you can't have a non-licensed taxi driver picking people up. That's against the law. You're not zoned to be a hotel. You can't have strangers paying to stay in your house. Amazon wasn't paying sales tax. You have to pay sales tax. They wouldn't pay sales tax. In America, and in free societies in general, you can do it, get dragged to court, you face the government in court, and you win. Not all the time, but a lot of the time, you win. And that is an important distinction. These companies have created trillions, trillions of dollars in wealth and led to breakthroughs in artificial intelligence and cloud computing and some of the most important technologies in the world coming from non-guided, non-stewarded innovations. Why doesn't every country do this? It's disruptive. You throw the, the industry champion out of business. You, you shake up the social order. It wipes out national industries. This hurts incumbent players, and if you think about it from a politician's point of view, who's more likely to be a source of campaign cash? A large, established, regulated company, or a small company breaking the law to offer a product that no one's asked for before? You see the, the reason that, these, that this doesn't flourish in most of the world, and even in the United States and in Europe, it's hard for it to get a, a foothold, these permissionless innovation companies, and yet they survive. Uh, in, a, in a 5G permissionless innovation world, you would have companies like Dell, that's not in the telecom business, able to come in and start offering products. You would have some junior at Caltech could write code in his dorm room that gets dropped into the telecom network the way it would today on the internet. You get all these wonderful applications you can get today on the internet that are written by anybody or nobody or Apple or somebody you haven't heard of. You can't do that in telecom. So we have to find ways to unleash this innovation and let it flow through into the telecom world, which is completely closed right now. It's not that China cannot participate in this model of innovation, but they won't. When the government considers the, most, the highest priorities to be harmony, control of the populace, uh, alignment between all people in, in society, you're not going to get toleration for radical breakthrough innovations and people that are breaking the rules and even breaking the law. No one has ever accused Elon Musk or Steve Jobs of being a team player. If you look at their counterpart in China, you ask, can China innovate? Jack Ma is one of the world's greatest innovators. <clears throat> he created Alibaba. He was on the verge of launching Ant, a digital financial services company, better than anything coming out of the US. He made one comment in a speech that the government had to stop, had to regulate less, not more, these new industries. They canceled his IPO, hundreds of billions of dollars it cost the country. They shut down his business school, which was fostering entrepreneurism in China. Phenomenal. Every, the best people wanted to go there, put an end to that. And really, Jack Ma disappeared. This was a couple years ago now. He is still not really back. They show him boating. They show him playing golf. They might as well show him finger painting. <laughs> He, he did not do any of these things when he was running his companies. And now, anytime you get a look at him, that's what he's doing. Unleashing this permissionless innovation is going to be critical to developing a native industry in the US and in other free countries. <clears throat> There's another strength that America has. And uh, as much as the rest of the world may deny it, the world trusts America. I have a line here that says, pause for laughter. So yeah, OK. <laughs> Uh, I have no delusions about how the rest of the world sees America. 
And you know, the, the rhetoric that you hear and everyone who travels abroad or, or lives, uh, comes from a place besides the Washington area, uh, could con consider that laughable. But if you look at people's actions, they can invest in rubles, they can invest in euros, they can invest in renminbi, they invest in US dollars. They trust the market's transparency. They trust our political system, which is a mess. But then you look at all the other systems out there. They trust our debt is going to be paid back. They trust the transparency of our markets. It's hardly perfect, but there's a, a, a confidence in America that is not shared with China. People don't say, look, if China says it, it'll stay that way. I can count on them. They're going to do what they're saying. And there'll always be recourse. If I don't like it, I'll go to Chinese courts, and I'll sue them, and I'll take, take my uh, recourse from them. People assumed, well, China would never kill the goose that lays the golden egg. At least you trust them to look out for their own financial interests. You look at what happened in Hong Kong. You look at what may happen in Taiwan. Politics is one thing, but China is willing to show that it's really the only thing that's going to matter in the end. They will lose the Hong Kong financial markets rather than lose the control over the people in that country. And that's why Taiwan becomes such a, a worry. <clears throat> Commercial procurement of any materials, I would say, from China, any materials that we're getting, I don't mean t-shirts uh, or chicken wings, but anything that's got any strategic value needs to be managed like we're on a war footing. We have to look at this not as com commerce with China, but as really effectively a political rival for power. It's political, not commercial, and that has to be the analysis that we're doing. Not just missile guidance systems. The Pentagon would never put in a system that came out of China, but factory equipment uh, is coming almost exclusively from China. Abrasives, industrial equipment is coming there, and if we didn't have it, we'd find ourselves really at the mercy, again, of the CCP. Things like pharmaceuticals, as we learned, are coming uh, in some cases exclusively from China. Does that mean we need to completely de decouple from China? I would not say so, and I don't think it's possible right now. But we need to contemplate our vulnerability and take more beyond economic actions to ensure the security when it comes to dealing with uh, supplying from China. We're dealing with a rival for global power, not a business trading partner or, ri or rival in business. The people at the IWP have taken on for themselves a mission to educate themselves and in, I think a lot of cases serve the country in ways that uh, require a good understanding of these challenges. And I'm just grateful that there's people that are doing that and I wish IWP and its students and, and associates good luck in this really important mission. Thank you. So we're going to take questions both from the audience here and from people that are watching online. So send in your questions if you're online, and we'll have them curated and delivered. Any questions in here? Yes, in the back. Um, very good presentation. I loved it. Great. It's a mic. Oh, <laughs> uh, very good. Uh, thank you for coming and, and uh, presenting. Um, so what's your take on considering what I would like to think of maybe four different markets, or three, so, or yeah, four. So you have like the continent of Africa, you have South America, you have Southeast Asia. These are all potentially low cost companies, or countries if you will, that can produce goods at a cheaper price, like China, or whatever. And then the other market is space. So basically as we see, you know, the lunar landings, and you know, eventually to Mars, and all that, and just, you know, cut off China and we just do our thing and, you know, kind of leap, leap ahead where China will have to, you know, deal with its own economy and internal issues before it can get anywhere. So, you know, what do you, th I mean, that's kind of a strategy, but uh, I, would it be effective? I, I think the answer is going to have to lie to, to looking to other regions of the world. China knows that too. So Africa, the influence in Africa is staggering. Uh, there, there's tribes now, speaking to people in, uh, both West Africa and East Africa, there are tribes that are now run by Chinese nationals. Uh, government has been compromised aggressively on the continent. Latin America, same thing is happening right now. These should be, countries like Brazil should be our opportunity uh, throughout Africa, both for 
for labor. You know, earlier development countries should be providing cheaper labor and natural resources. India should be a major source for this. Surprisingly, has not stepped up in, in the ways that you might have thought. It's the world's largest democracy. And uh, I think that the path will have to lie through something like uh, forming alliances. And China is way ahead of us in forming those alliances. Yes. Um, it seems like it's, it, it, where does this influence stop? Um, pretty much everything is is assembled in China now. Every laptop, most mobile phones, of everything. Is there any government agency in America that is actually testing all this stuff as it comes out to see if there's backdoors built in it? So, and in, in software, you know, I just found uh, I had some thing on my phone that was, re you know, recording all, all my phone calls, whatever. And I looked at it carefully. It's Chinese, you know, I, so I, de I deleted it. My friends in Ukraine say, oh, don't you have Telegram? And, and uh, I did for a little while, but it's Russian. And it's like, I have good reason to not have, you know, Russian software on my, my phone. Um, so, you know, it just seems it's, it's, it's so pervasive now. It's, is there any way to actually remove it? For, for example, every single modem has huge flaws in it that lets hackers get into it. I mean, every single modem on every laptop. That's right. It, the provenance of the products you're using becomes critical because if you're taking it from an untrusted supplier, detecting hardware or software deliberate vulnerabilities is almost impossible. It's not impossible. I spoke to people out at Idaho National Labs. Uh, they know more about corrupt hardware coming in than any of the equipment or service companies in America. They know about a bad phone uh, radio, say, than AT&T or Verizon, because they've got a bigger budget just for the security issues. Uh, they're not being used very extensively. And what they tell me is even they have to say, we're going to do triage. We know where the bad guys like to operate and where the low-hanging fruit are for them. So if there's a 1,000 things to look at, we can't look at a 1,000. We know which 20 to zero in on and they tear, take apart hardware, and they deconstruct software, the real answer is you got to know from factory to delivery that you at least trust the people making it were trying to keep it secure. If you're getting it from Hire, who bought out the GE appliance business and makes tablets and so on, I've spoken to security cyber experts who said, out of the factory, the Hire tablets had software that didn't make sense. It was stealing all this information, but there was no commercial value. It was learning who you are and what you do. But they said it wasn't really easily sold to marketers. And it was coming from the factory like this. It wasn't a hack. Uh, it's very worrisome. And anything sensitive, that means all factory equipment. Now it means appliances to a great extent, certainly communications equipment and software. You have to be, you have to be worried. And we need technology to come out and protect us to be able to use maybe compromised equipment. Any more in-person questions? Yes. Thanks. All right, so um, yeah, back to your, your point about um, like kind of the American supply chain companies having you know, very soft up with Chinese gear and telecom equipment and so forth. Not being a threat, and I totally agree with that. Um, what do you think of the idea of just having, you know, making sure that for the hardware, there's a separation between hardware and software. And the hardware becomes kind of commodity hardware, um, well understood standards across the industry. And then this kind of allows software companies to emerge and, and kind of compete on the, you know, often like open source software. Uh, and if we can kind of trust the hardware that's in our data centers and uh, like if, if there's some vulnerability in software, we can always just kind of flash that hardware and like update it quickly rather than having to redo entire data centers and the costs associated with that. Um, this you, is, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, do you see, is there any like, strategic direction here that you can actually see? You, you, you hit the nail on the head there. There's something called open radio access networks, which is one, one example of that. I don't want to say that's the future 100%, that's where it's going, but it may be, and here's what it is. It separates the hardware from the software, as you're saying. Today, if you're putting in an Ericsson cellular network, it's Ericsson boxes, Ericsson software, Ericsson control, everything's Ericsson. You can't swap it out a piece for Samsung or Nokia or Huawei. 
And you can't say, we don't like this Ericsson software, we're going to get some different software. Here. It is all integrated. It's kind of like saying in your car, you want to use a different windshield now, a different dashboard than the one that came with your car. You can't do it. You can change the tires. You can't change the transmission software control system. If you're driving a BMW, that's who made your transmission control, and you can't swap it for Ford. Open radio access networks lets you use off-the-shelf hardware. You can buy a Dell or an HP or a Fujitsu server, and you can have anyone write the software, and if you find, hey, this is corrupt software, you delete it, and you run some other software on it. What you can't do is that you have to trust that Ericsson didn't get compromised, or that Huawei didn't send a box that had some, some kernel in it that was doing something it wasn't supposed to. When you decouple everything, you can use a Samsung radio with a Nokia box that's running Ericsson software, and you take out the Ericsson software and put in something that came out of MIT and they're just trying. When we reach that point in communications networks, you've, you've greatly eliminated the danger. It's not gone, it'll never be gone. But you also bring sunlight, because now everybody can look at it. It's, it's not maybe open software, but it's more open. The interfaces become open, and you can have free access to look at software and hardware tested for vulnerabilities. That's definitely the way that people are starting to move in. Thank you. Yes. First of all, thank you for coming. Second, you talked a lot about how China had to kind of jump on this with all of this before we finally realized how much of an issue this was. What are the ways in which they now have a lead on us and how we fix that? In addition to eventually taking the lead and winning to the best of our ability, how do we undo the damage that's already been done? Yeah, if we had deployed Huawei as our national network, we had spent 50 or 100 billion. The, the cost wouldn't just be that 50 or 100 billion, it would have been the, the cutover and vulnerabilities along the way, things get embedded. And I'll be honest, you may be blocking Huawei and ZT from selling cellular gear, but they're pervasive in hospitals, universities, and libraries. They decided to make that not rock crushing facilities, they wanted to be in universities and hospitals where they decided that was information that they wanted to be moving for Americans and controlling for Americans. Uh, to, for the countries that went all in on Huawei, the damage is huge. The uh, Western countries became worried about communicating intelligence with each other because they said, hey, look, Germany, if you're going to put that in, Tom and Merkel decided to go with Huawei, we're not going to be able to share information anymore because you have a non-secure country now. Uh, they ended up backing out us to the UK, Australia, New Zealand, Five Eyes, and then went another direction. Um, to the extent that you rolled it out, you're compromised. And I will say that Congress funded, ripped and replaced to tear out all this Huawei gear from these nuclear cell sites. I was giving an interview to a reporter and she said, so what happens? Well, they funded it and it got replaced. I said, wait a minute. I sent an email to a friend who's working at one of the companies putting in the new equipment. I said, you did replace it last year, right? He said, well, about that. Uh, you can only replace it according to these rules with like equipment. So if you're carrying out Huawei 4G, they won't let you put in Nokia 5G because that's not the same. You can only put a Nokia 4G, and nobody today wants to install brand new 4G equipment in the network. <laughs> in fact, the nuke bases were saying, we don't trust 4G even from a good supplier, it's not as secure. So now, a year or two later, it's all still lying in those towers looking down over the nuclear missile bases. That's the danger you face. Okay, so this is the last question, it's from online. Um, it you said Hawaii is down but not out. How can we drive a stake through its heart? And are the Europeans still buying 5G from Hawaii? Yeah, so so uh, some places in Europe are still buying Huawei gear. Uh, most countries either outright banned it or just stopped buying it. They said, we'll buy whatever's best. But they just stopped buying it because they didn't want to face the wrath. In Germany, when they said we were going to not deploy Huawei, China said, well, what if we stop buying Volkswagens? Uh, Volkswagen sells more cars in China than the rest of the world combined, including Germany. So this would have been a serious uh, uh, blow to the number one biggest company in Germany. Uh, the, the uh, how do you drive a stake through the heart? Huawei has shifted to enterprise now. It's not as scrutinized as selling to AT&T or Verizon 
now they're selling, they want to sell to, they want to sell to Ford or GM or Johnson & Johnson or, or uh, Moderna and help equip their factories. It's not as scrutinized, the government has less oversight. And if it's not wireless in this country, I don't believe the current rules, and I have to parse it, I don't believe the current rules block anything at all from Huawei from being sold. And if they do, Huawei has spun off some of its companies with separate ownership, which still answers all the way up to the CCP. And those enterprise companies now are selling the gear that used to be made by Huawei. Now it's made by XYZ Corp. The same product being sold into uh, companies, including in America. So uh, it's going to take some serious commitment, especially when there's American companies pushing back, saying, you're killing us by not letting us buy this stuff or sell our equipment to Huawei. And we supply the Pentagon with secure stuff, but we also supply other things, and we need to be able to source it from China if you want us to be a healthy vendor. We won't put it in the Pentagon's equipment, but you want us to be making money elsewhere. And so, ironically, the DOD sometimes pushes back on, uh, on these regulations to, to, cramp, uh, to climb down in China. Thank you. I would like to thank Mr. Pelson and all of you who have joined us today, both in person and virtually via the live stream. If you are interested in attending other upcoming events, making a gift to IWP, or applying to one of our graduate programs, please visit iwp.edu. Thank you.